The following podcast may contain adult language and conversations revolving around situations not suitable for immature audiences. Spoilers and general political incorrectness can often be expected, so listener discretion is advised. They must be destroyed on sight! Okay, welcome back to episode 51 of the Must Be Destroyed on Sight, a movie podcast. I'm your host, Lee Russell, and I'm joined by my co-host, Daniel Harper. How are you doing, sir? Doing all right. It's been a long time since we've talked, really. Yeah, it seems like... Uh, it's like many, must be, many, what, six, seven hours, something like that? Yeah, many, many seconds. Many, many seconds <laughs> ago, a long time. Yeah, I was just on uh, Daniel's podcast, Always Space Man. We talked a lot more about a, an episode of, of Doctor Who than it probably deserved. Let's put it that way. But <laughs> It was a fun time, and uh, that episode will be up shortly. So, uh, yeah. yeah. All right. So we're going to be going to a little series of film noir, neo-noir, maybe just throw some straight-up crime films in there as well to see where it takes us. It's not a what we'd consider an official series or whatever. It's just, you know, we're just sort of... Going for that for a while. I'm just going to do some crime films and stuff like that and see where it takes us. And uh, We're going to be picking Robert Altman's uh, The Long Goodbye from 1973 tonight. Before we do that, we do have some listener feedback uh, from Henry, who has written in before. He uh, sent this just after we recorded our uh, Dawn of the Dead, so uh, we didn't get to slip it in last week, but uh, we're going to do it now. And he says, uh, I'm sorry that you didn't enjoy A Virgin Among the Living Dead as much as I had hoped. I think a big part of it is that uh, I didn't do enough homework for my recommendation. I had only warned you about the version with extra material from Gene Rowland. I didn't know about all the other versions. Despite how much it hurt Host by the Cemetery, I also hadn't accounted for bad dubbing in other languages. He says, the good version of this film is 79 minutes long and in French. This is the version which appears on the Image DVD release, which is how I originally saw it. He says it also appears on the more recent Redemption Blu-ray release. It offers a beautiful, oneric atmosphere peppered with disturbing moments. Uh, It explores themes of death as a tangible, contagious, and eventually personified element. It dances with the concept of a family curse which sucks in a person who never knew they were a part of it. As she returns to the lake with her family and fulfills this curse, we aren't sure just how much of the story was literal and how much was a Jacob's Ladder-style trip. Uh, I like how one of you said it was a Fulci-style ending a la The Beyond, but in 1974. Uh, He says also there are other things going on, including some black comedy or satire rooted in European class issues. An important thing to consider is that Franco made this film originally titled Night of the Shooting Stars, immediately following the death of Soledad Miranda. I think it's reasonable to say that this film was the physical uh, manifestation of his going through that. By the way, someone said that this kind of movie can be good without the plot or knowing what people are saying. While I was downloading your podcast, I noticed that there is a 75-minute version of this film on Amazon Prime. I put it on for fun and noticed that the subtitles were widely out of sync, so I turned them off. I watched it in French, sure. I'd seen it three or four times, so I had the general idea, but I have to say it only made it more dreamlike. Yeah, cool. I like that. Yeah, I think I would like to revisit that at some point, at least uh, personally, with with, uh, subtitles as opposed Mm -hmm. to uh, a dubbed version. I I think that um, that may be a film where the dubbing just totally gets in the way of, of everything. Um, yeah. So, uh, and I, I, I'll try to seek out that French language version, and maybe uh, I'll uh, watch it and chat about it later. I get exactly what Henry's saying. I, I don't, I don't disagree with like kind of his interpretation of the film. I, I think we're we're kind of describing the same thing and just kind of treating it differently. You know, <laughs> like yeah. Henry, Henry gets more out of it, but he sees looking at a slightly different cut. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to see if I can find that cut, and uh, yeah. you know, maybe we can get back into it at some point. Yeah, but, uh, cool. yeah. I didn't yeah. hate Virgin Among the Living Dead. I think that no. that's you know. I mean, I I think we we kind of enjoyed it. Just you know, all right, I'm kind of done thinking about this. You know, mm-hmm. um, 
I guess it really just didn't stand a chance stacked up to uh, the other the other two Franco movies we had done. It, it, it's just obviously he's working with a lot smaller budget at that point, and there's some issues, especially especially the dubbing, I think, probably does really hurt it a lot. kind of hurts the viewer's ability to understand what the hell's going on half the time. So, yeah, thank you for that, Henry, and also thanks for uh, teaching us both a new word tonight, Onerick. Uh, <laughs> I had to actually check that because I had never seen that word before, but uh, that means dreamlike, apparently, so awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks, Henry. Yeah, appreciate it. All right, and uh, I guess we can just jump right into uh, what we've watched in the last little while, uh, if you'd like to uh, start with that, Dan. Sure. I, I watched two things this week, and I'll uh, be uh, kind of brief. The uh, first thing I watched was a counterculture classic called uh, Putney Swope. Um, mm-hmm. I've never seen that film before. Um, I'd always known it, um, basically through connection with uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, who considers it a... Uh, a uh, big influence on him, but also uh, Louis C.K. You know, says that a lot of his stuff is kind of based on you know Putney Swope, and apparently he's interviewed on the DVD and that sort of thing. I've seen that film. I uh, found a copy of it and, and watched it. And uh, this is a very angry film uh, about a. Uh, have you seen the film? I saw it a very long, long time ago. But so. uh, it's a very angry film. It's about a uh, man, a, a black man named Putney Swope, who um, by happenstance ends up uh, the head of an advertising firm. And uh, most people remember this film for the uh, the kind of satirical advertisements. But to me, it was much more about like this kind of uh, growing uh, chaos and uh, insanity that was kind of going on in, um, you know, kind of left wing militant movements in the late 60s. <laughs> this is directed by uh, Robert Denny Sr., who, who is yeah. Robert Denny Jr.'s uh, father. I, I kind of looked into him a little bit. I mean, he's well known for making these uh, short films and lots of uh, really uh, abstract, lots of... Uh, highly politicized stuff and uh, it won't be the last uh, this is this is definitely his most famous film but it uh, won't be the last one i watch it was uh, very interesting and uh, definitely worth seeking out um if you're a, a fan of that sort of thing um it's it's rough i mean it's 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 not a uh, not a highly polished film but i think it, no. uh, it really is worth a, a visit uh, worth a watch um, if you haven't seen it so yeah, and uh, the other film I watched uh, this week um, is somewhat less politicized and uh, somewhat less, um, you know, j- just as intellectually rigorous and just as uh, interesting. I-, I watched a film called Can You Keep It Up for a Week? This is a <laughs> 1974 or 1975 British sex comedy, and I forget exactly where I found this title. I think I saw it in, like, my recommendations on imdb i was looking up something else and like you, you see that title and you go what is that film Can yeah you keep it up for a week clicked on it saw it was a kind of a british sex comedy it's about uh, this guy who um uh, is challenged by his thing girlfriend to uh, keep a job for a full week because he's apparently has a really hard time keeping a job and if you can keep it if you can keep this job for a week then i'll marry you and so he's t- tasked with this challenge. He gets a job at a um, like a personal assistant. It's, it's like a company that like uh, kind of a catch all. It's really a cleaning company called At Your Service. And uh, he goes on uh, little adventures that basically all involve him being uh, put upon by uh, beautiful young women who uh, <laughs> want to have sex with him. So uh, this guy lives a terrible, terrible life. Yeah. Um, it's a fun little movie. Um, there's a, it's it's only a little rapey, you know. So uh, you know we, we kind of judge these things, these sex comedies. It's not all that rapey, and um, it does have some some unsettling transphobia towards the end, uh, which was the only <laughs> thing that really made me kind of okay. I mean, it's it's period. It's not that bad, but it's definitely kind of there. But it's a fun movie. It's it's probably worth uh, seeking out if you can if you can kind of watch it for free or for cheap. You know, it's it's one of the better examples of the kind of uh, mid seventies uh, sex comedy, and it definitely fulfills its purpose. There is a ton of nudity in this thing. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I, I have seen that. It was on um, Canadian version of Bravo that we have up here. <laughs> nice. Uh, you know, they're always showing the highbrow stuff. They 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 had they did a series where they showed that and they showed all the. Uh, Confessions films uh, from the seventies, all those British sex comedies, and uh, a few others here and there. But um, yeah, so it, it is. It is fun. Uh, that's that's kind of one that uh, a lot of those sort of blend, like sort of merge together in my memory at this point. I can't tell the difference between either one of them, and they're all pretty much the same movie anyway. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's fun. Uh, well, we'll probably have to look into some of those when we get back onto our uh, sex comedy uh, series at some point this year. So. Yeah, do some do some uh, 
seventies British stuff, you know, because mm-hmm. I mean the the level of humor in the film is right up there with the, the title. You know, yeah. if 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 you kinda giggled at the title, this is probably a film that you'll at least get something out of. Um, yeah. you know, my my wife sat and watched it with me and uh, we were both just kind of oh that's cute. You know, <laughs> <laughs> she's like she's like, I don't I don't get where did this character come from? I'm like, just don't just don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> you know, we're not uh, <laughs> There's there's some character motivation stuff that I don't quite get at certain points, but you know because but um, this isn't the movie that's meant for that. This is uh, it's it's silly and it's it's cute and it's fun and it's got a lot of lot of lot of naked girls in it, you know. Yeah. So, um, and some some dick. There's a little bit of dick in it too. So uh, <laughs> keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, for me, I I saw on uh, Put Locker. I watched a really badly done. Uh, cam recording of Deadpool because uh, there was no way I was going to go to the theater and pay money for it or rent it or whatever. It was all right. There's not much to say about it. It's overhyped pretty much solely based on its marketing campaign that drew in a ton of fanboys and it's made a lot of money over this past weekend on fanboy love. And, you know, that's great, whatever. Uh, if you're into Deadpool, you're probably going to like this because from what I understand, like I've never read the comics or anything, but from what I understand, this is about as true to the character as you could possibly put on a on an, in an actual film. It's a kind of a hard R superhero uh, film. So, you know, that's a little different. And it, it kind of, I, I think it does kind of open the door for uh, some companies to say, hey, this stuff is actually going to put butts in seats. So let's start making some more adult oriented sort of superhero films. So who knows, maybe the next Wolverine film you see, he'll be slashing juggler veins open and shit and be blood spraying everywhere because that's the wolverine film i want to see he, he he did a little bit of that next man uh two or whatever but you didn't see guts coming out of the guys or anything and i'd like to see that personally but uh but yeah it, it was all right i mean ryan reynolds was probably born to do this role say all is forgiven for green lantern at this point uh because he, he does really own that film but other than that the film is just a standard uh sort of superhero movie plot or whatever, action movie plot. Some of the jokes don't work. Some of the jokes do work. I enjoyed it, but I never need to think about it ever again. <laughs> My wife is a big uh, Deadpool fan, so uh, we're, we're, we're definitely going to try to see that at some point. I'll chat about it then. Yeah, she, she's been a big fan of the comics, and it was really the hard part is that uh, Deadpool became so popular as a comic character that they started shoehorning him into all the, everybody else's comic. Mm-hmm. And so uh, there were all these like variant covers and all this stuff. And if you were a Deadpool fan, then suddenly <laughs> you figured out you were having to buy a bunch of extra comics because, you know, like he was just everywhere for a while. So Deadpool saturation kind of entered this house <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> and uh, she actually ended up like just stopping her comic collection altogether just because, you know, she, she wasn't reading stuff. But uh, yeah, we're, we'll, we'll check it out at some point and uh, I'll tell you what I think of it then. But uh, right, cool. your your your, uh, your description sounds pretty accurate, like from from what I've heard. Like, it, yeah, it it's is, fun, you know. Yeah, it's it's it's, it is it's, what it is. it's it's pretty much strictly for fans. I mean, f- fans are probably going to go away super happy with this film. So, I mean, they have of uh, <laughs> the reviews are pretty much glowing across the board from a lot of fans and stuff. So, the other thing I saw, which is far superior in my mind, uh, is this uh, horror movie from 2015 called "We Are Still Here." It's what starts out as a standard yet very well shot and moody haunted house film uh, set in the 1970s that looks very period, looks very, very much like a supernatural film from the 1970s. Takes a surprising turn and becomes a full-blown Fulci House by the Cemetery homage. And it done very, very well at at that. I was pleasantly surprised. This is sort of the uh, epitome of slow burn with great payoff because the final act just goes batshit and right into Fulci territory. And I really appreciated it. I thought it was really good. It's really well acted. Uh, it's got a very small, but really good cast. Barbara Crampton from the reanimator film and uh, from the beyond who is a major scream queen sex symbol in the eighties, still looking good now. And she's like 57 or something like that. Does a great job, great performance. And yeah, I, I highly recommend this one for anyone who likes uh, sort of good supernatural films and don't, doesn't mind some uh, hardcore fucking gore at the end of their supernatural films, you know. It, it's definitely a nice change from all these sort of uh, paranormal activity films and all these uh, 
films that are still sort of cashing in off the uh, J-horror craze that died out like 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, no, that sounds awesome. I, uh, I'll i uh, kind of seek that out and uh, check yeah. it out sometime. Yeah, but there, there we go. Uh, that's all I watched. And I think we can jump right into uh, our movie for today. Um, the Long Goodbye from 1974. Hey! Hey, Mrs. Wade! Sydney uh, Jenkins. Come on, let's go inside, Marlo. We want to talk to you. Oh, is this where I'm supposed to say, what is all this about? And he says, uh, shut up, I ask the question. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And it happens every day. Right profile. Sit down. Sit down. What the hell are you doing here? That's right. I'm getting ready to sing Swan. Swan, me, how are the behavior? When some passerby invites your eye to come her way. There's going to be a lot of people looking for me as a result of my lovely wife. If it was a murderer, he murdered his wife. That's a lie. I know he didn't kill her. He couldn't kill her. It's a minor crime. A minor crime, a misdemeanor to kill your wife. The major crime is he stole my money. Your friend stole my money, and the penalty for that is capital punishment. Even as she smiles a quick hello, you let her go. I like your face, too. Could you find my husband for me, please, Mr. Marler? You let the moment fly. I'm a man cannot stand confinement. Who the hell are you? Well, I'm this your private investigator who was sent here this afternoon to uh, find you. Did you come here to see me or my wife? It's none of his business. Write the check, Roger. What check? Write the check, Roger. Whoa. Lady, you turn your head. You know you said the long goodbye. You'll never learn. You're a born loser. What do you think, Mabel? Ow! If you have any trouble, I'll back you up. I have fresh evidence now for you to reopen the Terry Lennox case. If you ever think about suicide, Marlboro? Me? I don't believe in it. Goodbye. Don't you try to be nice to me now. I'm leaving and it's goodbye. I ain't running after you in the rain when you're catching a plane. No more. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. I'm through, I'm through this time, and I mean it. Directed by Robert Altman, uh, written by Lee Brackett, or Lee Brackett, actually, also based, of course, off the novel by Raymond Chandler. Uh, Lee Brackett's interesting. Uh, she used to write for Howard Hawks. All his films, uh, or a lot of his films, uh, did Rio Bravo, El Dorado, Rio Lobo. She also did The Big Sleep, uh, 1946. And she's also credited on writing the first draft for The Empire Strikes Back. Before uh, it, it, She died before it came out, but um, she, she does have credit on that as well. Starring Elliot Gould who is back after a couple of years of being kind of blackballed from the industry because of his ego, apparently, uh, from what I've, what I've heard and read. He was kind of a prima donna back in the day. Nina Von Palant as uh, Aline Wade. Uh, Sterling Hayden, a uh, famous director and uh, actor himself, uh, as Roger Wade. Mark Rydell as Marty Augustine. Henry Gibson, uh, who you might know from The Burbs, as Dr. Verringer. Uh, David Arkin as Harry, Jim Bowton as Terry Lennox, Warren Berlinger as Morgan, Joanne Brody as Joanne Egenweiler, and Stephen Coit as Detective Farmer. And uh, I believe you have a little bit of a synopsis written up there, Daniel, so you can take it away. I do, um, and I will have a lot to say about Lee Brackett as we uh, kind of go on in this uh, conversation. The Long Goodbye. In this very loose adaptation of the classic Raymond Chandler novel by the underappreciated Lee Brackett, Philip Marlowe was a man seemingly unstuck in time, an anachronistic atavism of an idealized 1950s living in the sun-drenched flower-child utopia of 1970s Los Angeles. 
When approached by his friend Terry Malloy, nursing a hell of a shiner to help him get out of the country, Marlowe asks few questions and does as he's asked. A decision leads him to be arrested when it is discovered that Malloy's wife has been murdered. After three days, Marlowe is released, Malloy apparently having killed himself in, in an isolated town in Mexico. Seemingly unrelated, Marlowe was hired to find a missing novelist, Roger Wade, Sterling Hayden, by Wade's gorgeous wife, Nina Von Pallant. And a violent gangster who was owed money by Malloy is also hot on Marlowe's tail for suspicion that Marlowe might have some of that missing cash. That, I that, will... I'll, I'll just let you know, that plot summary, for anyone who hasn't seen this film, uh, definitely makes the film seem much more linear than it is. Just, yeah. uh, it's, it, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot more, uh, it's Altman, so it doesn't proceed that literally, but... So, uh, but that's that's kind of the, the basic plot, you know, of the film. Yeah, actually, I'll just uh, let you continue on there, Dan, if you like to get into your sort of initial thoughts on this one, um, and especially since you you have just recently read the book as well. So, uh, yeah, I uh, I actually reread the book. I had uh, not read it for about ten years or so, but I uh, I kind of took the opportunity to pick it back up again and reread it. The novel, I would I would recommend the novel. I think it's the longest of uh, Chandler's novels. Rereading it now, I mean, it's definitely got some sexist and some racist stuff. I mean, I'll just say there's a minor character who's literally called the tough mechs in the, in the <laughs> film, or in the in the in the novel. Um, and so you go, there, there are definitely moments where you go, yeah, this was written in 1953. You know, there's a lot that's left out of the novel, or a lot that's changed in the in the movie rather. I can kind of talk to that a little bit here and there if you if you're interested. Um, yep. But uh. It's definitely worth reading the novel. The novel is um, one of the classics of the genre, obviously. And uh, I had I had actually originally thought when I started talking about doing this film, I thought that there was a like a forties or a fifties version of this film. There's not. There's only this one adaptation of it in cinema. So there's not like a kind of a classic noir version. We're talking about the film itself. You know, I, at the time, I think uh, Lee Brackett was was uh, writing this and, and kind of Altman directed and, and Gould performed. I mean, as as kind of a satire of the. Uh, mm-hmm. of the uh, the, the noir genre where you know we're basically taking Marlowe we're calling him uh, I think there's a there's a feature on the DVD called Rip Van Marlowe yeah. where the idea is he's been asleep for 20 years and he wakes up and he's <laughs> got these kind of old school values and he's living in this 1970s uh, Los Angeles and uh, just kind of how my how times have changed it was kind of the, the the point of that character or the point of, of kind of what's going on there's a lot of kind of um genre self-awareness going on um which honestly a lot of that's actually in the original novel i think people push too hard on like how self-aware gould's marlowe is where you know even in the original uh, novel there's a lot of the oh is this the bit where you know you tell me you know that you've got another guy on the other side or something like that you know there's a chandler comes fairly late in the um you know the kind of evolution of the the detective novel, the noir novel, and so a lot of what Chandler's doing is kind of a reaction to kind of the earlier Sam Spade stuff, yeah, and, um, and those kinds of uh, characters. So I think we kind of uh, think of Marlowe as this kind of very classic, you know, kind of noir character, which he is, mm-hmm. but at the same time he's still kind of a reaction to some of the the more kind of straightforward heavies that we saw in, in kind of pop boiler detective fiction earlier on. I really like this film. I think it's 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 probably a masterpiece. Um, this is during Altman's, you know, kind of the early '70s period where he was just hitting it out of the park every time. I think this gets a little bit forgotten in Altman's overall. I think we don't kind of think of this as is towards the top of his uh, of his you know the top shelf, like the top five or six Altman films. This doesn't quite reach that level, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think is. Uh, it's a really tough book to adapt. I mean, the book is 500 and something pages long, very, very long for, for this kind of genre. And yeah. there's a lot of kind of meandering plot and, uh, the way that, uh, the bracket and Altman kind of work together to, um, basically get off all the cruft and just give you this very straightforward plot, but then kind of meander around it in terms of the way that, that it was directed, I think is one of the, one of the, brilliant things about it um and I'll, I'll kind of dig into that i mean i can kind of dig into specific examples um as we kind of go on with the discussion i really like the film a lot i think it's definitely worth watching it's a really easy watch i don't know uh, kind of how you found this but i think that altman kind of gets a little bit of a reputation for being too abstract or too artsy in his direction or too you know i think i think that a lot of people don't don't think oh i can just sit down and watch this but this is a fun movie like this is fun mm-hmm. to watch um, and there's a lot of really cool stuff in this so I, I really love this. Uh, I had seen bits and pieces of it when I was younger on TV, I believe. 
but uh, I'd never watched the full way through. So watching it, uh, the couple times I watched it this week for the podcast, for the first couple times I really watched it, I loved it. I, I was watching it, and Elliot Gould's performance specifically was just sucking me into the whole thing. I, I loved what he was doing with, with the character. I love how he's constantly sort of mumbling his lines around. He's always sort of cracking wise and kind of deflecting what people say to him. He, he, he sort of puts this barrier up of, of verbal diarrhea almost, keep, keeping, keeping people out of his sort of uh, personal space to a certain degree. And then it really does sort of help put forward that idea of a man out of his time, you know, some, some guy who's found himself 20 years in the future and the, the world has moved on uh, from him. And I mean, the, the guy's not distracted by anything. Like, uh, unless you actually find a way to get into this guy's personal life, he does not react uh, emotionally. He does not get distracted by you. I mean, he lives across uh, from his top Pinos apartment to this other apartment filled with these beautiful, mostly naked women, most of the time doing yoga all the time. And he doesn't bat an eye at it. He's like, yeah, whatever. It's he Southern California, man. Like, you know, <laughs> like, I just, I, you know, I, that was actually one of the elements that I really appreciated about, about, uh, Gould's performance is just the degree to which, oh, those are my neighbors, you know, oh, yeah. that's cool. Like, whatever. I mean, um, he, yeah, he, he doesn't walk over to flirt with them. He walks over to take their order because he's going down to the grocery store to get cat food for his cat. Mm-hmm. I mean, in yeah. Elton scene is like, what do you want? Oh, we want the, we want the uh, brownie mix. You know, uh, you want the chocolate and the regular, right? All right, I'll get you that. Uh, it's okay with me. Uh, <laughs> or okay by me, whatever he says, his little, little sort of tagline he uses all the time. But yeah, I mean, I just love how he, and it's it's a good defense mechanism because people don't take him serious. Like everyone around him, uh, I, I noticed like he's sort of portrayed as like a really kind of good and moral guy in a world full of people that don't treat human life with any regard other than how can I use this person for my own gain. And so a lot of people think they can actually just push him around and he sort of lets on that he lets himself be pushed around for quite a bit of the film. His performance, he, he, he kind of fools people and in, at the same time he's kind of fooling himself about what's really going on. Uh, there's, there's a lot of layers to his performance that I uh, really appreciated watching this and I, I think the story, it's not very hard to follow. It, it flows very well. There, there's never a slow piece to this and I think part of that has to go with the fact that Altman's always moving the camera. I don't believe I saw one still shot in this entire film. E- even when he's got that shot framing uh, the car and there's a dog walking in front of his car and he's trying to get the dog out of there, he's still moving the camera while he's doing that. And I was like, wow, that's the, the whole, the movie just moves all the time. The camera's always moving. I like the uh, sort of twist in the end. Like it's, it's kind of obvious. Yeah, like all these films generally tend to have a twist. They have, tend to have a complicated plot that the detective only unravels at the very last moment. But that twist serves to bring out the true Philip Marlowe underneath this sort of verbal shield that he puts up around himself to keep the outside world uh, out of his uh, personal space. But the the real sort of uh, Marlowe from the books, and I've read a couple of the Chandler books. I, I have not read this one. But you see that real authentic Philip Marlowe character come out at that last moment there and at the uh, final, final uh, part of the film. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I, I'm going to differentiate here between um, Chandler's Marlowe and then we'll just call it mm-hmm. Brackett's Marlowe or all yeah. Marlowe, you know, um, Gould's Marlowe, I guess, you know, Chandler's Marlowe is uh, definitely much more of a tough guy. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there are kind of sequences in, in, uh, Lots of sequences, actually, in the Long Goodbye in, in Chandler's book, where uh, Marlowe has to uh, take a beating from from the cops or from the um, uh, the gangsters or whatever. Um, there are several sequences where he, uh, you know, kind of beats people up or where he, you know, twists people's arms, that sort of thing. You know, this isn't a guy who's afraid of a fight. Cool, Marlowe doesn't live in that world. I mean, he's he's much more. Uh, he he talks his way out of situations, or he thinks his way out of situations a little bit more. I'm um, not to say that Chandler's Marlowe doesn't, but you know Chandler's Marlowe is kind of both comfortable, you know, duking it out mm-hmm. or out talking people, um, which is interesting. One of the uh, major differences between the novel and here, I'm going to spoil a 65 year old novel here, so uh, <laughs> you know, 
one of the major differences between the novel is that the novel is much more about kind of institutional rotting. You see a lot more of kind of the different layers of society. You have, uh, you know, uh, the main antagonist, like the character Marty Augenstein, you see her in the in the movie, uh, doesn't exist in the novel. Um, the the kind of the major antagonist is actually a guy named Harlan Potter, who's uh, kind of the the rich, wealthy kind of William Randolph Hearst character um, okay. sort of guy. Um, he owns a bunch of newspapers and he's like a, a billionaire or whatever. And, um, you know, he ends up be, kind of being the, the major shadowy force that's behind um, a whole lot of kind of what's happening in the film. The uh, kind of relationship dynamics between um, Eileen Wade and Roger Wade is much more complex in the novel. Um, in fact, uh, in, the, in the novel, um, Eileen Wade shoots Roger Wade. Like she actually uh. kills him. And uh, then she kills herself, and then uh, she leaves the confession that she killed her husband. Roger Wade was, actually was the one that killed uh, Sylvia. Wife of his best friend. Sylvia there. Malloy. Sorry, I forgot the name there for a second. Sylvia Malloy. Lennox, Lennox in the movie. Oh, was it Lennox? Yeah. yeah. Am I saying Terry Malloy? Terry yeah. Malloy is the guy who played Davros in uh, the... Uh, oh, jeez, that's right. I should have picked up on yeah, that, too. I was... I <laughs> Okay, I was totally apologize to everybody. It's Terry, Terry Lennox. I apologize. We, we, um, we've podcasted too much today, I think. <laughs> we have, yeah. Or I've just, I've got, you know, Terry Malloy was on my on my brain, and I'm like, that doesn't sound right for some reason, and then I just let it go. Um, yeah. uh, no, so... Um, yeah, Sylvia Lennox was was actually killed by Roger Wade in the in the novel, and then uh, you kind of it you know, works out that uh, Terry did fake his own death, but it was a, a lot more of a kind of complicated thing. And it turns out he got some plastic surgery, and he actually walks into Marlowe's office, and mm. uh, you know, as this as this guy, he's pretending to be a Mexican. And the novel is much more about kind of the rotting institutions and about kind of uh, the fact that you know the rich guys and the poorer guys, the, the gangsters and the uh, the newspapermen and the cops and everybody all have their angle and they all have kind of systemic corruption. The movie isn't about that at all. The movie really focuses on these particular characters. And I think that that's a, a wise decision. I mean, I'd love to see somebody actually adapt the novel in a, in a kind of a little bit more um, straightforward way. But it would it would look a lot more like something like L.A. Confidential would, would kind of be a, a kind of more literalistic or a kind of uh, take on the novel. I think Altman's film and, and Brackett's script, um, you know, the two of them, Brackett and Altman, work together in kind of these extended, like, um, like day-long meetings where they would sit and talk about the story and kind of work out. And, and um, notably, Altman never read the novel. Um, he mm-hmm. kind of, he kind of, he had read a bit of the novel, and he had like a, a some like this book of critical essays on on Marlowe. Yeah. Uh, on Chandler that he was kind of working from. Um, and then Brackett had read the novel, obviously, which I think is interesting that, that uh, Altman was really just kind of saying, oh, I'll adapt this, but I'm not like, I'm not working off of the original. I mean, he really was kind of, they were really going off and making their own thing. But I think the decision to focus on these characters and then to make some, some kind of fundamental changes to the ending um, really um, sells this idea of Marlowe as a, as a kind of a moral character and really sells that, um, you know, Terry Lennox is, is just kind of a, a worm of a guy. Yeah, he's he's a straight up psychopath, honestly. Like he, he is just the way he the way he talks at the end, you know, um just like he just dismisses the fact that he killed Sylvia, like I had to do it. And Marlo's like, I saw the pictures, you didn't have to do that. He just brushes it off like it's nothing. You know, it was just a complication that I had to <laughs> I had to deal with. You know, uh, the, the guy is just totally soulless, and it's 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 kind of like the movie kind of moves to that point. It gets to a, sort of a peak where Marlowe has been surrounded by all of these really amoral, nasty people who are in their own self-absorbed little worlds, and they're uh, hurting people and discarding people. With, with reckless abandon, and it finally gets to the point where it touches Marlowe in his actual life, and he can't stand it anymore, the, the final betrayal uh, from Terry, and him being even worse than the rest of them just finally sets him off, and then the real Philip Marlowe comes out, and <laughs> that's where you get the end of the picture. But uh, yeah, I really love the shot of him walking uh, be- on the road between those two those trees, uh, where, he, where he's coming it reminds back. Reminds me of the third man. The, the, the ending. Of the third man. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, I apologize. That's, Go ahead. Yeah. So, so I was, was going to say, I was like, I, I've seen this before. Where have that's the third man. That's the fucking third man that he just sort of lifted that and stuck it in there. And it's like, that's great. I, I really like that. And 
this movie was a real pleasant surprise. Like I, I heard it was good. Uh, I know when it originally came out, it was uh, not well re- received at all. Like for the most part, most of the critics didn't like it. Uh, it didn't do very well at the box office. Uh, the budget was 1.7 million, and I think it only grossed uh, 959,000 in um, the U.S. I assume it probably made its budget back eventually, but it didn't do well. Which well, it's weird. a weird little movie, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, especially when you're, you know. In seventy three, you know, if you're if you're releasing a movie that's you know like, hey, look, it's a Philip Marlowe movie, you know, yeah. um, and then to do this kind of weird, you know, kind of satire almost, I think that you know it's not enough of a kind of outright parody to really sell it as a comedy, but mm-hmm. you know, it being this kind of weird offshoot of a noir, I mean, there's not a shadow in the fucking film, like it's <laughs> it's, I mean, it's it's. Very much like I feel like Altman almost went out of his way to never include anything that looks like a noir shot. Like this is this is a character out of a noir, but not not a not a, a traditional noir. I mean, it, it, and yeah. I, that feels very deliberate from Altman. I mean, you know, the, the like almost everything's during the daylight. For instance, almost every scene is is he, he puts a very stark contrast. Uh, it it just goes to help reinforce the idea that yes, indeed, this is a noir character who's not a classic noir character who's not in a classic noir film. Uh, right. You know, he, he, I kind of so. I I even um th- this is the I, I I watched it for the uh, again for the for the podcast, but I'd seen this several years ago. The first time I watched it, I didn't even like process it as like oh he's a man out of time. I just thought oh he's kind of an eccentric guy. You know, like yeah. oh, he's a guy. He's a guy wearing a, a shirt and tie, and that, like, like that's cool. And I feel like you can interpret it either way. It's yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be like oh, he's literally this guy from out of time. I mean, it's just sort of just just as long as we're talking about you know that element of it. Uh, and I don't want to push too hard on this. The the idea that like in the fifties things were like that people uh, had this code of honor and this this these kind of ethics, and people were loyal to their friends and stuff. Um, you know, it, it does. Uh, it does kind of. It is a little bit of a reactionary kind of idea that, like, 1973 was this like kind of decrepit time mm. of immoral behavior and et cetera, et cetera. And even the crooks are like, you know, remember when people had jobs? You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> it, it feels, uh, you know, it, I'm not sure quite what the what the the message we're trying to send here is. But the 50s were not like some you know utopian halcyon period. Yeah. And, Los Angeles, um, as the novel very clearly shows, because the cops are like the worst people in that book. You know? Yeah, they're just. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm. I'm going to be rereading a lot of the uh, the other Chandler novels because I, I found them all. So I'm going to be uh, digging through those just as uh, kind of fun things to do, especially now that we're uh, going to do some noir and some neo noir yeah. stuff. So I, I feel like I want to I want to I wanna, uh, ask you uh, how do you feel about uh, the Wades, Roger and uh, and Eileen. Well, first off, Roger Wade is, <laughs> is is a perfect little sort of Hemingway character. He, he's very much Heming, modeled after Hemingway, you know the 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 bearded, manly writer who uh, you know is a alcoholic and uh, every once in a while beats his wife and you know has guns everywhere and just drinking yeah. all the time. Let me let me just say I am a I am adjacent to some writer communities because you know my wife has an MFA in poetry and you know so uh, you know I I know some writers I've known like people with like getting PhDs in poetry who act like this like there yeah. are these kind of guys who are literally like you know I'm a writer and I got to be like badass and you know, gambling and you know like doing you know. I got to get my buddy hold my wad and that sort of thing. Like it's a, it's a very, it feels like there's this like performative masculinity that some writers just feel like they have to like exude in order to exist. And so this character feels very real to me. So I just wanted to, um, I haven't seen like somebody literally like have like 20 rifles on the wall and that sort of thing, but you know, I've seen (laughs) similar kinds of behavior. So I just wanted to throw that in there, but Please continue. I, I apologize. Yeah. I it was sort of hard for a while to get a, a read on uh, Eileen. And I think that was fairly intentional. Like, she's the sort of femme fatale in this one. So you, you kind of expect in the back of your mind that there's something else going on with her, with her other than what she's presenting right up front. And I don't know why I did this, but I, I went to the sort of depths and dredges of the uh, Internet Movie Database uh, comments section and i saw tons of people just just wondering why she contacted marlo in the first place and it felt like it was pretty straightforward to me that you know she had seen him in the newspaper after the uh 
Linux uh, disappearance and apparent suicide, and she figured, um, A, she could probably get some insight into what was going on, and B, she probably could manipulate some things to her own advantage or whatever, but... Um, she, she saw him in the paper, and I mean, I think in the, uh, in the novel, this is uh, made a little bit... There's some extraneous stuff. There's a bunch of extra stuff that's in the novel that, you know, there's, a, there's some kind of minor characters who kind of come in and out, you know, for a little bit. Um, like, in, in the original novel, it was uh, not Roger Wade is missing. It's Roger Wade can't write, and uh, we want Philip Marlowe to come and, like, basically figure out why he can't write uh. and uh, basically stay with him and, and, you know, kind of babysit him because he's descending into alcoholism, but the, the publishing company wants another book out of him. Hmm. You know, they, we want one last book because we, we already advanced it to him. And we want to be able to sell the fucking book. And then after that, he can he can shoot, dr- he can drown in a bottle if he wants to. But you know, <laughs> until then, um, so there is this kind of cynical take on that. Um, I think uh, for the film, I, I just interpreted it as she saw his face in the paper. She uh, saw that he was loyal to his friend Terry. And um, in the movie, it's made a lot more apparent that, like, Terry Lennox lives. I mean, the, the, these guys are friends, you know, that... Yeah. that um, so I saw that you knew my friend Terry and I'm looking for my husband and I saw your face and I said, I'm going to give you a call. I think there's also this kind of intention, at least, you know, once you see the end of the film, I think you could also kind of say, well, she's trying to set up Marlo for, for the, for the murder, I think is kind of where it's, where it lands to some degree as well. So, so yeah. there is that kind of, that kind of, uh, hidden subtext. I mean, there's, there's a lot of motivation that it's not. It's not necessarily literally spelled out, but I think it's it's fairly readable in the film. But it does require a kind of a close read. Um, some of it, you know. Yeah. Uh, what What did you think of the humor in this film, though? Because there is there is a really nice streak of humor in this, but it's not. I mean, this is a this is a satire and almost kind of a spoof on the sort of noir genre to a certain degree, and it's not the naked gun. You know, it's they're not right. doing pratfalls. It, it's and, it's not broad. It's not. Yeah. It, um, I. I really love the humor in this. I mean, the, the the great thing about the tone here is that it works as this kind of weird oddball comedy, but it doesn't overplay itself. And it, it still feels like it's existing in this kind of consistent world because there are these scenes of violence and there are these scenes of, uh, you, know, you know, there is kind of a real moral heft and a real character heft to mm-hmm. what's going on here. And the comedy doesn't take away from that. The comedy just kind of sells this kind of weird world that, in. Yeah, it, and it is. Uh, I mean, you know, you got to think like a, a kind of a Hollywood director and a, a Hollywood writer, and you know, these are you know Lee Brackett lived in California for thirty years or so, forty years at this point. Um, Altman had been working since fifty seven, so I mean, you know, like I, you know, saying look at what a madhouse Los Angeles is is, is sort of a uh, a reasonable thing. I, I thought that was uh, yeah. Um, it all seems to come from characters. Is yeah, kind of the, where I land. You know? Yeah, it, it comes from the eccentric nature nature of all the characters in there. Like they're all in their own little worlds. They're all kind of weird and um, isolated from each other to a certain degree. And I mean, even the menacing characters, they have this air of ridiculousness to them. Like the the gangster Marty Augustine is a ridiculous motherfucker, but he's also a violent um, motherfucker. He's a brutal monster. Like, and well, he's a there, guy. There's, who, there's a particular scene in the middle of the film which I think yeah. we need to talk about. Um, where he uh, he has this this lovely young woman Mary something mm-hmm. who is uh, who he's dating and, and who he, he takes her with him to a uh, to beat up this guy this this private eye mm-hmm. you know sit in the car sweetie it's okay listen to the radio if you want to he's kind of belittling her she's just kind of oh yeah hey okay, whatever um, she gets scared she gets spooked she comes up in the middle of like where they're they're shaking down Marlo and um, he breaks a coke bottle in her face. Yeah. Um, and, and smashes up her face real good, um, just to you know that that's somebody I love. And look what I did to her, and now I don't, I, you know, I don't care about you at all. It's Marlo, like it's a threat to Marlo. What I found interesting is I actually was get curious about this, and I dug up the um, one of the uh, initial drafts of the script. I don't know; it, it says revised draft. That scene is not in the uh, in the draft oh, really? of the script. Which means it must have been a later edition. So, I, because it is so much, I mean, that character only exists to be a uh, the Mary character. She only exists to be uh, threatened by Augustine. And mm-hmm. I was, and I, and that's such a problematic thing from a you know from a kind of feminist and you know kind of just a character basis. Like, why why do you have this character who only is here 
to be threatened by this gangster boyfriend. You know, this does not feel like, I mean, it, it sets the stakes, but it, it you know, it, it isn't a very good character, you know, ultimately. Yeah. Like, her motivations are, are not clear. Although I think there is some resonance and we can kind of talk about it a little bit. But, uh, and I wanted to look, I wanted to say, like, well, what, you know, how is this written? How did this work on the page? Like, and then to find out that that scene isn't even there, like, they, it's just a shakedown scene. In the, yeah, in the, in the it, version it feels of the script, like, I think it's, it's like February seventy two. So I don't know how many more drafts we went through, but at least in that draft, she's not there. Yeah, and so it, um, it feels like it was just stuck in in the last minute to basically helps uh, you know bring a serious moment to it and help sell how dangerous this gangster really is. I mean, because you couldn't have them, you couldn't have them beat. Marlowe so bad that he couldn't continue with the case or break his arm or something like right. that because that just wouldn't work in the context of the movie. So it's like, let's write in this gangster mall girlfriend who's, I don't know, you you could read her as maybe dumb or maybe drugged up or something along those lines. Just uh, smitten, like starstruck. Yeah, could like, be. He's this, this guy, Augustine. Actually, the the lines, some of the, um, the language that Augustine uses to describe himself in mm-hmm. that... Um, Earlier on, you know, when he's talking about his wealth and he calls the uh, he calls Marlo cheapy, that's actually um, dialogue that's taken out of the billionaire Harlan Potter character's mouth from the uh-huh. novel, and that was something I, I kind of picked up on. Is I'm not sure it's like literally taken, but it's very much that same sort of idea. Like they call him cheapy and that sort of thing. Like, oh, you're a cheapy. I wear a ten thousand dollar suit. You wear a fifty dollar suit. Sort of idea. Yeah. So I, I thought that was a kind of an interesting, you know, like in the the way that they kind of shifted that. Um, over, but yeah, no. What, what I think is might be kind of what we're going for here because she also she, she also sl- shows up later in the film um, with the bandages um, during the scene with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, in that part, um, which I'd forgotten. The, clothes off. <laughs> I forgot. I had forgotten Arnold Schwarzenegger was in this film, and I went, "Oh shit, Arnold Schwarzenegger." What I started thinking about was the fact that you know Eileen Wade is staying with Roger Wade. And she is clearly a battered wife. You mm-hmm. know? And then uh, you see, uh, you know, Sylvia was beaten to death, you know, yeah. by uh, by Lennox. I think we are supposed to see the cycles of violence here. I think that that's sort of the the idea. It's like this is how this starts. She's like, well, he still takes care of me, and he gave me medical attention, even though we did this terrible thing. And you know, maybe he's not such a bad guy. And you know, he's. He's a likable character. I think that that's uh, Augustine is like he's you know I think we're we're kind of supposed to think he's kind of charming and kind of even though he's he's violent and he's he's a bad guy he's not our he's he's a, probably our primary antagonist through mm-hmm. through much of the film. But you know I don't think we're supposed to read him as this like terrible monster. I think we're supposed to kind of oh yeah he's kind of he's likable he's fun you know when he's on screen you're kind of what's he gonna say next? He's got people taking yeah. off their clothes and I, you know, I think. I think I think, that, you know? I think well I think that scene was put in there because I think they probably realized that he was maybe a bit too likable in the original draft. So okay, let's have him break this poor girl's nose, and then I think the mo the more horrifying thing is actually the scene later on where he brings her back in. See, I, I fixed her. I apologized yeah. and I fixed her, and that makes everything right. And it's like no, that doesn't make everything right. You're a fucking monster. And that I think and, that actually, for me personally, that sold for me that he was a much more scary kind of monster than a lot of people probably think when they're you know interacting well, with this guy. And I think that the one really positive thing or the one interesting element is that um, Mary and Marlo share a moment in the office, like when they've all kind of left, and it turns out that they've been delivered the money. And then there's just it's unspoken. There's just this you know they kind of look at each other and they kind of see who each other are. Mm-hmm. And um, Marlo knows there's nothing he can do. Yeah, you know, like it's it's just sort of, and I, and I think that 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 sense of kind of defeatism, you know, to to a degree, like there's nothing I can do here. This I can't. What am I going to do? Take this girl away? She doesn't want to leave. She wants to stay here. I can't convince her. You know, I think that that maybe plays into the decision he makes at the end of the film to to, to yeah. kill. Uh, Lennox because it's like, well, this is something you did something terrible and I can at least make you suffer for it. And you're officially dead. And you're like, I don't know. That's an interesting element as well. Um, sorry. I kind of, I was kind of on the fence as to how I felt about the, the inclusion of the Mary yeah. character and ha- talking about it with you. I'm now kind of like, I, I sort of get it. I wish it wasn't just, you know, a character 
brought in to suffer for you know the the complexity of a male character that's just it's just so not okay but you know it, it's there and it and it works it just mm-hmm. uh, it's just it's just kind of uncomfortable for me but you know yeah that's where uh, it goes. speaking of cameos there was also an uncredited cameo from uh, david carradine in the jail cell yes yeah, socrates <laughs> yeah socrates i i thought I, I i laughed at that when i saw that yeah um I didn't uh, recognize him. I saw he was in the cast. I went, "Who was he?" And then Socrates. And I'm like, "Who? Who the fuck is Socrates?" <laughs> Socrates. <laughs> and then I, I went and I, go, "Oh shit, man! Like that was David Carradine." And I went back and looked at it. And I'm like, "Holy shit, that was David Carradine!" That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I well, I will say I, I did like what they did with the soundtrack with this, the uh, John Williams Johnny Mercer uh, oh, yeah. song that is basically just repeated in different arrangements throughout the entire film, sometimes hummed and sung by the characters themselves done by uh, Marlo at the end there after he kills Lennox and walks away. I, I, I thought that was really cool. Just sort of keeps this constant tone in the film and this sort of undercurrent of some sort of energy connecting everything in this little world together to some degree. And then the only other piece of music on this is really uh, hooray for Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I really like the score, and of course, it's John Williams pre-Jaws, you know, before mm-hmm. he becomes John Williams, you know, when he's, <laughs> when he's just a guy doing music for movies. It's a, it's a nice it's a nice theme. I found myself humming the long goodbye, like, later after watching it, you know, I kind of, <laughs> you know, I, I do, I do kind of like the, the various arrangements in it, and it does kind of play, you know, the idea that we're seeing this, we're seeing the same tune through the film in so many different situations, it does kind of play the, kind of the the cycles of violence, the cycles of, you know, this kind of corruption and evil and stuff. Um, you know, I do wish the film pushed a little bit harder on, on the kind of systemic corruption stuff, the way that the way the mm. novel does. Um, but I understand why it's, it's focused on. This yeah. Um, I, I don't think, I don't think it, I don't think it's interested in the corruption so much. Like you'd, you'd have to see that more overt, overtly in something like Chinatown, which is explicitly yeah. about that. I think, here it, it's very much focused on the sort of self-absorbed nature of the way the culture is becoming. Everyone sort of living in their own little bubbles and uh, sort of treating each other really badly. I think it was more interested in that than anything else. And you know, just the eccentric nature of all the characters. I mean, this is a this is a satire, or whatever, that doesn't go broadly overboard. But then you look at a movie like The Big Lebowski years later, which also is based on Chandler's stuff and actually pretty much riffs on Chandler's work exactly the same way this film does, but just heightens it up a couple degrees. Right. So. Well, the Coen brothers definitely, you know, in that film, they, they definitely just kind of push things to a, to a more cartoony direction. Like this mm-hmm. is not quite a cartoon. This is still kind of feels grounded, but you know, I can understand like another degree or two, it, it would have definitely felt uh, cartoony. One element I, I do want to talk about Roger Wade uh, briefly, and in, in terms of mm-hmm. the difference between uh, the the film version and the, and the book version. In the book, Roger Wade is a, a writer of romances. He, he's he's yeah. writing romance novels, um, which I think meant something slightly different in the fifties. Like these are like top selling romance novels, so I think they're, they're they're not quite like Danielle Steele or something. It's 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 it means something slightly different. In the in the novel, uh, he's he's frustrated with his inability to put another novel and he's kind of like, I write trash. I write trash for people to read who are not really very good at reading, but like whatever. And he, hmm. he's kind of this frustrated artist just a little bit, but then he's kind of descended into alcoholism um, as part of that, you know, his coping with his kind of lot in life of look at the gorgeous woman that I married and get to fuck. And, you know, yeah. look at all my, all my money. And I'm such a, I'm such a terrible hack, you know? And I'm like, dude, like, get over yourself what's really the only the, the reason i bring it up is because um chandler wrote the uh the novel like a, a big part of the long goodbye is that um uh terry lennox uh in the novel is a war hero he's actually a man who was like captured as a, as a pow in in norway by the nazis um in the in 1942 mm-hmm. and in fact he has scars all on his face because he like captured some shrapnel and he got you know Chandler was himself in that situation, so so Terry Lennox is something of a uh, of a, a Chandler author insert. Uh-huh. And so was Roger Wade, um, because Chandler struggled with alcoholism his entire life, 
And um, the novel is very, like, I was reading and, like, my God, this sounds like both seductive and destructive elements of alcoholism are very um, <laughs> elegantly and brilliantly described by Chandler in a sense of a man who knew what he was talking about. Yeah. Uh, and then here in the here in the film, you know, the idea that, that it's Sterling Hayden who was this, mm. you know, towering giant of a man and kind of played more as a Hemingway figure, but no less self-destructive. Um, you know, he's, he's very destructive, not just to himself, but to those around him. And the, the decision to, uh, you know, he didn't kill uh, Sylvia in this, but, um, you know, I, I absolutely believe in the... Um... No, he did kill Sylvia. Doesn't no. he? No? no okay. No. Ter- Terry, Terry Lennox kills Sylvia. Okay. And they, they were pinning... They were... They were sort of they were just basically looking for someone to pin it on for the most part. So I think they were casting it as to Roger at, at one point and you know, playing okay. Marlo and everything like that. So No, but it, he pays uh he pays the forty four hundred dollars to the uh to the to the doctor and that's a uh that's his uh alibi, right? Like the in the in the film, the whole point is he wasn't actually out there for a whole week. He was only out there for a couple of days, but he paid the doctor to say he'd been there for a whole week. Isn't that the point? So Roger Wade was stepping out on his wife with so, Sylvia. With Sylvia. He kills her. He kills himself. And then Sylvia, uh, I mean, um, Eileen goes to uh, live in Mexico with her, her lover. That was the book, though. That was, In the movie, it's, it's a little different. Uh, Roger is actually innocent of, I think, pretty much, pretty much everything. So... Okay, maybe I, I mean I, I I will fully admit that I may be getting them confused because I was rereading the book and I I meant to finish the book and then watch the movie, but I kind of ended up just in terms of trying to make sure I got the movie watched before we recorded. I ended up watching the film and then I finished the book a couple of days later, so I may be getting some details confused. But I, I need to go down because I would. All right, I I don't I don't know, but I I, I thought that it was still like implied that uh, Roger had killed uh, Sylvia, but um, that may be just in the book. Um, so you know, maybe I, I think I, th- I think I think it was implied, but I think it was meant to be implied just to confuse the viewer and to also just to keep Marlo spinning his wheels and running around, right? Right. So. I love that Marlo figures it out while he's drunk. Yeah, I love that he's, he's sitting there and he's drinking the bottle of, sh- and he's still got the bottle of champagne in his hand and he's still swigging on it. And he's like figuring out like, oh, and this guy died and then there, and then he, he kind of working it out in his head while swigging on a bottle of champagne. Yeah. I think that's a, a nice little moment because we're so used to, at least today, you know, in these kind of like um, procedural TV shows and stuff, we see, you know, the, the genius, like all the math around his head and like figuring it out and like, look at me and I'm precise and analytical. And this is more like, he just kind of talks and he kind of figures it out and it's like intuiting it almost. It's uh it's kind of a neat little moment. Um, for yeah, me. Yeah. I, I, I like the, and that's part of the satire of it. The, the kind of, he figures it out while half in the bag, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll just, I'll just mention uh, one little brief thing and it'll be a good segue because you wanted to talk about Lee Brackett. The character Sheriff Lee Brackett from Halloween is named after her. Uh, mm. from John Carpenter and John Carpenter, of course, was a big admirer of uh, Howard Hawks films and her writing for those films. So that was a nice little homage that that came came away from Carpenter, who who is just a massive Western fan who always wanted to make westerns more than anything else. But oh, that's awesome! I didn't know that about John Carpenter. That's that's brilliant. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so so Lee Brackett is um, a lot of people would argue she's the person who made The Empire Strikes Back. What The Empire Strikes Back is. Um, she was kind of the, the real, uh, although Lawrence Kasdan was the kind of the other scredited uh, screenwriter mm-hmm. for that. And, you know, I have enormous respect for Lawrence Kasdan um, as well. So I don't know, but um, I don't think Empire Strikes Back would be what it what it is without her influence. What I what I kind of learned, and I'm actually reading one of her novels now. I uh, it's actually ironically called The Long Tomorrow, and it's her <laughs> most, her most famous novel. Um, and it is a science fiction novel. It's a post-apocalyptic novel. So I'm reading that, and I may talk about that a little bit next week. Uh, hopefully, I'll have that finished by then. But she was a uh, you know a a woman in this kind of male-dominated field. Um, she was uh, both a kind of uh, known as a, a crime writer and a science fiction writer. Mm-hmm. And she was writing in kind of the pulp uh, science fiction uh, magazines and stuff, and she created some uh, some characters and. I just I thought it was interesting that she was one of these kind of well known writers in the forties, did a lot of screenplays, wrote a wrote a um 
you know, a couple of the, the Bogart movies, or at least wrote The Big Sleep, and that's actually mm-hmm. why she got this uh, job, was because uh, she had written the, the Big Sleep in 46, and uh, Altman's like, bring it on to her, or uh, the producer, uh, whoever the producer was, because um, Altman was actually hired later, um, after she was hired. Yeah. I really, I was kind of just looking her up, and I was kind of reading her, reading about her on Wikipedia in preparation for this, and I, and I came to really admire her, you know, as someone who was you know, who had made a name for herself, both as a crime writer and as a, a science fiction writer, uh, kind of, from what I gather, one of the kind of um, unheralded geniuses to some degree. And uh, she just isn't much remembered today. We don't we don't talk about her enough. And I, I think that's partly because of her gender and partly because, you know, she's a writer and she, she kind of, like a lot of what writers do in these things is a little bit invisible um, to yeah, us. You know, we kind of talk a lot more about you know, the direction and we talk about the actors and we talk about, but, you know, oh, well, Robert Altman, Robert Altman's, you know, The Long Goodbye, not yeah. Lee Brackett's The Long Goodbye. And I, and I, I almost want to, I almost want to just call it Lee Brackett's The Long Goodbye just to, uh, to <laughs> stick it in there just a little bit. Um, because I, I, you know, it's very clear from, from reading about the kind of the making of this film that Brackett is as much a, you know, she, you know, you read the novel and there's so much to this novel. Like it is this hugely kind of complex, convoluted puzzle piece, you know, like putting together of all these pieces and, and everything. And to find that through line and then just to just blatantly rip it off and then rewrite it in, in a different way to make it this totally different thing. That's, that's at the same time, very true to the spirit of the original novel, but does its own thing and to, to change certain plot elements. Um, it's a ballsy move. I mean, it's, it's a really, it's a really ballsy move and uh, a really talented, it's clearly the work of a really talented writer. And I, and I would recommend that if you've, if you've seen this film, I would recommend you uh, to buy the novel or uh, read the novel, <clears throat> find, find the novel online. And uh, and check that out because it's it's absolutely worth uh, reading. Um, and and just comparing the two is a kind of a fascinating uh, project. Uh, it, it was common back in the day, like like you said, she came from that sort of uh, pulp background. A, a lot of people didn't didn't even know that she was uh, a woman. Uh, they assumed Lee because uh, that can be interchangeable. Right. Uh, a lot of people thought she was a man, and of course, the publishers back in the day they weren't going to let on that she was a woman. They they were happy to try to sell more uh, books uh, and magazines. And that was a common thing. Like uh, uh, women, uh, blacks, uh, Jews, uh, what have you, who are writers, uh, usually they gave them fake names, white names to, you know, to sell to the audience. Um, Mm -hmm. And there was, there's a great, I think it's two parts, uh, deep space nine episode where Benjamin Sisko gets teleported back in his mind or something like that to, uh, that era where he become where he's a frustrated black uh, pulp writer, science fiction writer who you know is struggling against that system or whatever. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's just uh, it's just one of those things. I just I I, I wanted to highlight her because mm-hmm. I, I think that um, we do. I think thinking about this film, we do kind of shunt her to the side just a little bit. But I, I think that this is as much hers as it is Altman's yeah. and Gould's. Um, and um, you know, I, I again, I'm reading one of her novels, and I'm I'm hoping to to kind of dig into a little bit of her back catalog and uh, kind of check out some more stuff. Um, I'm I'm hoping to. I actually I think I've seen the original Big Sleep. I'm not sure, but my plan is to watch that at some point in the near future. Yeah, because so. there's the uh, there's the remake with uh, Robert Mitchum. There's the Rick. there's the there's the original, and then there's the Mitchum version. And yep. uh, we had talked about maybe doing those two together as a, an episode yeah. of this show. So. Uh, that would give me an excuse will. to sit down and rewatch them up both. So yeah, yeah, and and, and Mitchum also went on to uh, play Marlowe again in Farewell, Farewell, My Lovely, I believe, as well. Oh, uh, did he? Yeah, okay, yeah. that's awesome. So yeah. yeah, yeah, I don't know if I have much more to say. I, I really love this film. Uh, it's a great film. Definitely high high recommendation for it uh, for anyone out there interested. Um, it, this would be on this would be on my top ten list this year, except I've already seen it. So yeah, yeah uh, I, I am counting it on my top ten list this year so far because I, I I count this as a first watch, even though I saw bits and pieces back in the day. That's but, fair. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I've definitely seen this film before, so it doesn't it doesn't count for me. But it's it, it's absolutely way up there, and uh, I would if you're a fan of this podcast, you should watch this film. I mean, it, mm-hmm. it's 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 just it's brilliant. It, it's absolutely worth it worth your time. Yeah, I uh, don't know quite what 
yet what we're going to be doing next week. Uh, we will be back with another uh, noirish or neo neo noirish sort of film. We'll we'll discuss it and figure out something for next week. Daniel, uh, tell everyone about your Doctor Who podcast. Sure, um, I do a podcast, and we're fifty one episodes in, and you should hopefully know that I do this, but uh, I do a podcast called Always Spaceman. It's uh, with my wife, and uh, it's all about Doctor Who, classic and new series. Check us out if you are so inclined. Lee Brackett did not write for uh, <laughs> Doctor Who, but uh, she probably should have. I would love to see a Lee Brackett written in an episode <laughs> of Doctor Who. And uh, we'll be coming out in the next couple of days or so after uh, this episode comes out. We'll be uh, one with Lee himself. Mm-hmm. where We'll talk about a, a kind of awful um, Dalek episode from the 80s. Uh, so uh, check that out. If you're if you're so inclined, yeah, yeah, that's it. We got a, oh, we and got that's Oi Spaceman. That's Oi Spaceman. All in word. That lives Yeah, and we got. I think we got a lot of good uh, mileage out of that uh, shitty Doctor Who episode. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so uh, you you can find all our extra stuff at our uh, Podbean site and everything uh, when you listen to the trailer at the end of this. Questions and comments are always welcome. We want film suggestions, recommendations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Good or bad feedback. We don't care as long as it's feedback. Uh, go to our iTunes. Subscribe to us on iTunes. Give us a five-star rating. That'd be nice. Write a nice little note or a nasty little note, but give us five stars. Don't be daunted by seeing some of the episodes uh, on the iTunes list that are listed at like six hours plus. I don't know what the fuck's going on there. We have not done a six-hour podcast yet. Yet. Uh, <laughs> yet. <laughs> but, uh, yes, there's something well, about we're iTunes. We're going to cover Living Dead, and that might be a six-hour, you know. If we yeah, did three yeah. hours almost on Dawn of the Dead, we could probably do six <laughs> on Dawn of the Living Dead. Yeah, but uh, for, for some reason, iTunes didn't like some of the episodes that it's grabbing from it from my feed. So it, it incorrectly lists the times as, like, six hours, four hours. Uh, guaranteed we have not done an episode over two hours and 43 minutes so far. So if you see one that says six hours on there, don't worry about it. It's actually only probably about an hour. So you don't have to, you don't have to be scared away. Um, but yeah, we're going to take off. Thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for Danny, uh, joining me, Daniel, and, uh, we'll be back next week. We will. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Happens every day when some passerby invites your eye to come her way. Even as she smiles a quick hello, you let her go, you let the moment fly. Too late, you turn your head, you know you said the long goodbye. Can you recognize the theme On some other street Two people meet As in a dream Running for a plane through the rain If the heart is quicker than the eye They could be lovers Until they die To try when a missed hello becomes a long hello. Recognize the thing on some other street. Two people meet as in a dream, running for a plane through the rain. 
If the heart is quicker than the eye, they could be lovers until they die. It's too late to try. Mm -hmm. When a missed hello becomes a long. Try to be nice to me now, I'm leaving and it's goodbye. I ain't running after you in the rain when you're catching a plane. No more goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. I'm through, I'm through this time and I mean it. In fact, I don't know if I ever even did like you, except for your body. Your body was good. Well, this let's say so long. Thank you for listening to They Must Be Destroyed on Sight. To see the host's other stuff, as well as links to websites and podcasts of similar interest, and as well to leave comments, questions, movie requests, and other suggestions, visit us at tmbdos.podbean.com. From there, you can also find us on iTunes. You got this, man. You got this by the ass.